Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, back when I was in Hawaii, I met with the people from the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope, and I talked to Jess, who uh, told us about something called the Event Horizon Project. This is a collaboration between multiple telescopes that use submillimeter radiation all across the world, and the goal is to get the highest resolution images of the black hole at the core of the galaxy. Now, to put this into Jess's words... To get the kind of resolution we need to see these things, you need a telescope the size of the Earth. Many of you are curious about this statement, how it works, how telescopes that are thousands of miles apart can collaborate and generate better quality images. Now, as it turns out, there is a fundamental limit to the resolution that can be achieved with a camera, whether it is a telescope, a DSLR, or even the cameras in your phones. All of these devices, regardless of their size and complexity, work using mirrors and or lenses to focus light onto a small surface with the sensor. The size of the image on this sensor depends upon the focal length of the optical system. The longer the focal length gets, the more the image gets stretched across the sensor. And you can actually see this happening in some zoom lenses where the lens will move out to make the focal length longer. You might think that you can just zoom in with no limit and say the new Nikon P1000 camera which offers 125 times zoom, well you might think hey maybe there's the next generation of super zoom cameras will go even further. Well back in the 19th century a guy called William Dawes studied the ability of telescopes to resolve binary stars and other details and he developed an empirical rule which is known as Dawes limit. This sets the limit of how close two stars can be on the sky and still be resolved as two separate objects. And it happens that it's inversely proportional to the aperture of the telescope. So wider telescopes with bigger mirrors can get more detail. Lord Rayleigh would then go on to formulate the actual physics of this and derive it. This wasn't some you know, limitation of the accuracy of the hardware or of the atmospheric seeing. It was a fundamental limit caused by the wave nature of light. The light waves travel through the optical system and are brought into a focus. As you probably know, combining waves produces interference, whereby waves that line up with their peaks and troughs exactly aligned will amplify themselves. But if two different waves come in with their peaks and troughs lined up instead, or where the peaks were their troughs and troughs were their peaks, they'll actually cancel each other out and produce no light at all. This is called interference. At the focal point of a, a, an image, all the parts of the waveform will travel exactly the same distance. So they arrive in phase and the image of the point source gets made bright and con uh, amplified by constructive interference. But as you move slightly away from this point, the uh, path lengths start to change. You know, the path from one edge of the mirror becomes slightly different from the path length from the other. And so they begin to go out of phase and eventually they cancel each other out and the image goes away. But it's not immediate. A perfect point source will generate an image which has non-zero size. And in addition to this central peak, you'll actually get a multiple a set of concentric rings going out from this that get fainter and fainter. Anyway, you know, Lord Raleigh, he did the math. Actually, no, he did the mathematics because he's British and he came up with something called the Rayleigh limit. This is a Rayleigh criteria, which is the angular resolution of an optical system is at best 1.22 times the wavelength of the light divided by the aperture of the telescope. Any closer than this and the smeared out light spots become overlapped and are impossible to distinguish. And this isn't just true for visible light, but it's true for ultraviolet, for infrared, even for radio waves. There's a great chart here summing things up. You can see here that those big radio telescopes with massive apertures get worse resolution than the small amateur telescopes because the wavelength of radio waves is so much longer than the wavelength of light. So that Nikon camera I mentioned, it's actually running pretty close to this limit at maximum optical zoom before even the digital zoom kicks in. So there's not a great deal of room for next generation cameras to go further in this way because, the phys because of these physical limits, they would need to actually increase the aperture of their optical systems as well, which would make for a much larger camera. Similarly, those uh, smartphones, 
they're pretty close to the limit of angular resolution already. And it's one of the reasons why uh, new generation smartphones aren't adding huge numbers of megapixels to differentiate their cameras because the detail simply isn't there. The other major reason being that the small aperture uh, lenses that are used just can't capture enough photons to make noise-free images. Having said that, there are various processing methods that can be employed to reconstruct the source, or at least attempt to do this. You have to understand how the light will be smeared out uh, according to a specific profile. And this is called, uh, you know, you can define this profile by uh, something called the point spread function. That is literally the way that a single point of light will get spread out in the optical system. And you know, this will include other uh, effects like imperfections in the optics. It's not really a simple problem. It's not just plug in the numbers and get the results, but it has been used with some success to get direct images of exoplanets where you can extract or subtract out the brightness of the parent star and see uh, exoplanets that would otherwise be lost to direct imaging. And with the best optical resolution that we currently have of any instrument, is something called the Very Large Telescope Interferometer in Chile. Uh, it's actually four different telescopes spread around a single site, and each telescope collects light and then feeds it into a central focal plane through a series of optical pipes where it gets combined. The effective aperture for resolution purposes is comparable to the size of the entire site. Effectively, it's like a single large mirror with big chunks of it missing, right? And that's why radio telescopes all around the world can combine the signals they receive to get resolution equivalent to a telescope the size of the planet Earth. Radio telescopes can record the signals, not just the intensity, but the phase information in the signals. And the interference pattern can then be simulated by combining the signals electronically or even in software. This process is called Very Long Baseline Interferometry, or VLBI, enabling resolutions higher than are possible with optical telescopes. But this can't be done for optical telescopes right now because while light is a wave, it's also a particle. And optical detectors basically are sensitive to the particle nature of light. You know, the photon comes in and knocks electrons off and that generates an electrical signal. But in that process, you lose the phase information. And that's very important if you want to then reconstruct the interferometry. So that's why the very long uh, the VLTI sends its light down these optical pipes without converting it to an electrical signal. It, these optical paths have to be kept really accurate to within one tenth of a wavelength, 50 nanometers. The target is never exactly overhead either, so there's some telescopes that will be slightly nearer than the others. So every light path also has to have diversions where they equalize the length of the path to make sure that the total path length is identical. And I should also make it clear that all of these large telescopes necessarily include adaptive optics, which will sense the turbulence in the atmosphere and uh, compensate for the motion by flexing the mirrors to make sure the atmosphere doesn't affect things. So the Event Horizon Telescope that we started with, it's using telescopes all around the world, giving the largest possible aperture, and it's detecting w uh, wavelengths of the shortest possible where technology allows us to recover the phase information. So in theory, they will be able to deliver the highest angular resolution possible of any telescope on the Earth. Of course, that does leave the prospect of building interferometry systems with the telescopes in space. And this has been done. In the 90s, the Japanese launched a spacecraft called Muses B, which was used as part of the VLBI Space Observatory program. Uh, that operated until about 2003, and right now Russia has a spacecraft called SPECTRE-R, which op orbits out almost as far as the moon, 350,000 kilometers, giving a pretty large baseline. Anyway, as a fun final note, you can use this these re resolution limits to answer other questions. For example, uh, certain conspiracy theory channels will say that spy satellites can read newspaper headlines from orbits. Well, can they? Well, let's do the math. Using a 0.5 centimeter resolution from 250 kilometers, that would be 4 milli arc seconds of resolution. The diffraction limit 
means that this would have to have a camera lens, an optical system, tens of meters across. And there simply aren't any satellites that look that large right now. Amateur satellite spotters in th like Thierry Ligot uh, would be able to see these things. But you never know what the future holds. Maybe one day this will happen. But we don't think it's happening right now. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Mm -hmm.